Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I am, uh, uh, and and you know, one way to say what I do for a living is to say that um, I develop scientific instruments, and they could be scientific instruments. Um, is in uh, software, right? And, and uh, I work with a journal called Software X to publish those types of um, instruments. But then I also work on instruments in infrastructure, and those are clouds. Um, uh, and, and in particular, there's this one instrument called Chameleon, which is really a, a test bed for computer science research. So it's a test bed where people can test new ideas. It's a collaboration between the University of Chicago, which is where I am right now, uh, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, RENSI, and Northwestern University. So for those of you who don't know, chameleon in a nutshell, uh, chameleons, of course, are animals that are known for their um, adaptability, their ability to change. Um, and we develop an environment whose um, main property is the ability to change. And the way it changes is it adapts itself to your experimental requirements, right? So in other words, you can reconfigure that um, the resources of this environment completely. Um, at, at bare metal level, you can allocate bare metal nodes, uh, which you then later on um, uh, reconfigure. Uh, you can boot them from custom kernel. You can turn them on, turn them off. You get access to serial console. So this is a good platform for developing operating systems, virtualization solutions, and so forth. Another thing uh, that we invest in also is, uh, of course, hardware, so that our users can explore hardware at scale. And so we have many thousands, of course, on the testbed, but then we also have um, uh, six petabytes, over six petabytes of storage uh, for uh, data science, big data experiments. And we have all of this distributed over two sites at University of Chicago and Texas Advanced Computing Center, which are connected by a high G, by 100G network. So you can also experiment with large flows. And now the scale is complemented by an investment in diversity. So we've got a bunch of arms, atoms, um, different um, uh, CPU architectures, as well as different accelerators, uh, interesting networking hardware, and so on and so forth. What makes Chameleon a little bit different from, from test beds that came before it, which were typically developed using some sort of in-house infrastructure, so what makes Chameleon different is that it builds on mainstream infrastructure called OpenStack, right? So uh, OpenStack is is uh, something that thousands of developers contribute to. We can leverage their work. We also made contributions to OpenStack, uh, in particular to a component called Blazor, which was included as a as a top level OpenStack component in 2017. Um, it's also familiar to both users and operators. So it's range of benefits to build on top of mainstream open source. Um, and uh, some stats, quick stats about uh, the system. It's, it got funded in 2014. It went public in 2015. And, and it, uh, it, it's an open infrastructure, so uh, many people can use it. Um, and uh, including, of course, international partners. Um, uh, and it, uh, we have uh, hundreds of publications, almost 6,000 users at this point working on, on 7,000 projects. And I am right now having um, difficulty changing the slides. Maybe I'll try someplace else. Okay. Um, so... One of them works, the other one doesn't. Um, so a, a quick look at maybe, let's see if, right, so we've got chameleon by the numbers here. Um, uh, like I said, uh, quite uh, many thousands of users um, that we had privilege to work with. Um, and then chameleon hardware. So what you see here is uh, chameleon hardware as it was in phase one originally acquired at the beginning of the system. Uh, we've got those 10 racks of, of Haswell um, nodes that were acquired at TAC, allowing people to um, run HPC experiments. Uh, but then also we had an investment in, um, in storage as well as uh, many heterogeneous components there. Um, and then in, um, in the second 
uh, phase of Chameleon, the second uh, Chameleon proposal that we got, we got a hardware re refresh, so more modern architectures, sky lakes and cascade lakes, more uh, hardware, and there also a more interoperation with other test beds. So in the US, we've got a networking test bed called Fabric that we interoperate with. Uh, the two Chameleon operating sites at TAC and University of Chicago were joined by Northwestern, and we are working with many other potential partners to join the project. Um, and then finally, we've got interoperability with commercial clouds, uh, which in the US, uh, there, is a, there is a project called Cloud Bank, which provides interface to various different commercial clouds. Um, and now, uh, just recently, Chameleon got extended uh, until the end of 1024, and we're going to be upgrading um, our various different hardware components, getting more GPUs um, to our already impressive collection since uh, machine learning and, and data analysis uh, in general are um, a, a very hot research topics right now. Um, upgrading our uh, connection fabric, um, networking hardware, and so forth, but also branching out into IoT devices, supporting IoT and edge devices so that our users can do uh, research with that type of, um, with that type of um, hardware. Um, so how is this uh, hardware configured? Um, you know, we talk about experimental workflow where you formulate the hypothesis, then you figure out what resources you may need to support it, uh, and then um, allocate those resources, so gain temporary ownership uh, of those resources, and then finally figure and interact those resources and run your experiment. So in Chameleon, we've got a very good uh, discovery services that give you up-to-date and complete view of those resources. It's versioned. Um, and that also allocate, allow you to allocate those resources, right? So you can you can uh, get resources by on demand, but you can also do that by making advanced reservation for those resources. Um, and then once you get hold of those resources, right? You you do it on a per node on a per node level. You can reconfigure them at bare metal. We will give you a library of various images so that you, you're not starting completely from scratch. Well, some of those images have things like CUDA and, and TensorFlow on them for easier experimentation with GPUs. Uh, we've got images that represent MPI clusters and so forth. And then you can configure those images further. And once you configured them, you can save them. You can snapshot them, save your work, so that next time when you come to the test bed, you don't have to redo that whole uh, configuration work. And you can start um, from the last snapshot. We've got orchestration services that allow you to deploy uh, complex con constructs like uh, virtual clusters or cloud configurations. And we're also integrated with Jupyter, right? So these days, people use Jupyter notebooks very often. All of that is available to our users via web GUI, via command, inter command line interface. And, and increasingly, our users are, are uh, like to use the Jupyter interface, which I'll try to talk about that later. So uh, a quick run through of the various different experiments that people run on the test bed. Um, we've got one of them here. Um, this is a comparison of performance of virtualization and containerization, uh, which required a large scale test bed with state of the art resources, um, and of course, the ability to boot from custom kernel and, and do all sorts of things like that. Um, here's another project by my colleague from Argon. He's designing exascale operating system, also something that can be experimented with on the test bed. Here's a project in security from a, a group of students from um, a small university. Um, access to resources that they can share was, was an important thing that mattered to them. Another project in creating dynamic super facilities um, um, orchestrated via the virtual uh, software-defined exchanges. Um, so that needed network stitching, sophisticated network capabilities in order to run these types of experiments. Also, the ability to, um, to deploy complex structures. Um, here's a couple of projects in data science uh, from a couple of students uh, who became semi-finalists of the ACM student competition at Supercomputing 17. So they need the access to GPUs and a lot of storage um, and, and things that um, support data science. Uh, another networking uh, project from a very talented student, and I'll come back to this one because what the student did 
ultimately um, is is um, as exciting as how she did it, right? So she was one of our first Jupyter Notebook users, and, and it was um, a, a great breakthrough in packaging experiments using them in a certain way. Um, a power management project with a, a university of, from a University of Chicago student, and finally a project in federated learning. And I'll stay with this one a little bit because I, I said at the beginning, chameleons like to change. This is an example of how our users and their interests and the need to do interesting research drive change in the testbed itself. So federated learning, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a, a distributed kind of learning. Uh, typically used with IoT and edge devices. So typically those IoT devices collect some sort of data that is private and can't really an IoT device. So you train model on edge devices connected to those IoT devices so that the data does not have to leave the domain in which it was produced. And then you send the models, the trained models, to an aggregator that aggregates them, produces a model that, that has the aggregated knowledge from all those different um, uh, learning experiments. So it's an interesting um, project from our, our users. Uh, by the way, you can read about it on our blog. It was last month. Every month we profile one of our user projects and, and you can learn a lot about the hot research in computer science by just following the blog. But um, those were users who are using Chameleon for their federated learning, but they didn't have edge devices on Chameleon, right? So they were emulating what they wanted to do rather than experimenting on the edge devices that they wanted to have access to. And so that made us realize that what we need to do is extend our cloud testbed to the edge, right? And that raises the question, what does an edge testbed look like? And in that space, we had two kinds of answer, answers, right? One, one set of users would say, oh, an edge testbed looks a lot like a cloud, right? All the features you know and love, you want to get an edge device and you want to reconfigure it and you want to experiment with it. And another set of users who would say uh, an edge test, but it's nothing like a cloud at all, right? It's, it's completely different. You don't have resources that sit in a data center. Location matters. Um, the, the access to that location can be very challenging. Access in terms of networking, um, the power management on those edge devices matter, matters. They come and go. They are connected to a host of IoT devices, to cameras and actuators that drive uh, self-driving cars uh, or, or other vehicles to software-defined radios and so forth, right? So um, two disparate views on the matter. And out of that, we designed something called Qi at Edge. Qi stands for Chameleon Infrastructure. We're taking Qi, Chameleon Infrastructure, that, that operates our um, data center test, but our cloud test bed, and pushing it out to the edge, right? And we're pushing it out to the edge such that well, we own some edge devices, but we also support a mixed ownership model, right? So we add, we allow our users to add their edge devices. We give them an SDK that they install in order to add their device to the testbed. Um, and we give them access to those devices via a virtual site, right? And the, the devices that they add to the testbed, they can share them with everybody. They can share them with just the research group. Uh, we're sort of trying to figure out how to make it easy for them to both share devices and have access to large uh, cloud resources at the same time. So once we figured that this is what we needed to build, what you know, how do you build a testbed like that, you know, the best way that you can? And and in doing so, you will encounter a lot of familiar challenges, and those are in fact. Um, the hardest challenges for how to share resources. And those are challenges that have to do with sharing, right? How do you manage access? How do you secure network connections to the resources? How do you um, uh, arbitrate resource access? Um, and, and all sorts of other sharing considerations. But there are also new challenges, right? How do you reach devices in remote locations where the uh, uh, networking access is perhaps not ideal? Um, how do you integrate those peripheral devices? I was talking about um, like cameras and, and software-defined radios and so forth. So what we decided to do is take OpenStack, right? I, I said earlier, made a big point of, of how Chameleon is built on top of OpenStack. We decided to take, take OpenStack. And OpenStack already had implementation that supported containers 
rather than bare metal this which is what we were going to do here right um and and adapted to operating in a wide area network environment right so we opened up that container based implementation and we said let's see what assumptions we have to change right in order to take it from a data center into the wide area and and we made some tough choices in there right so we sort of very carefully changed some assumptions and re-implemented some components and some other ones um, didn't need re-implementing and yet some other ones we decided to live with for the time being. Right? The advantage of doing that in terms of OpenStack uh, was of course that we already integrated OpenStack with things like Jupyter and Federated Identity Access and all the other sharing mechanisms in Chameleon. Right? So now having those um, uh, those features became relatively easy, right? And here is a, a quick um, snapshot. We're going from running in a data center, right, where everything is secured, to running in a wide area, to running devices that people have constructed on their kitchen tables and that are also connected to various um, IoT devices like the software-defined radio that you see in that picture with the dinosaur there. Um, how does that influence the user experimental workflow, right? So for now, our resource discovery is very, very simple. It's not as sophisticated as we have for our cloud offering. But allocating resources, you can do pretty much everything that you can do on Chameleon, right? So you can um, make do advanced reservations. You can allocate those, um, those devices on demand. Uh, but you also can say, you know, I want a Raspberry Pi, and it will select one from a pool of Raspberry Pis that we have. Or you can say, I want this specific device, right? This specific device that is connected to uh, that software-defined radio or, or, or that dinosaur. Um, reconfiguration is done by container deployment, like I said, and, and we adapted that container deployment to connect to all the peripheral devices, all the cameras and, and things like that. Uh, we provide a catalog of images for our users as before. You can modify those images and then later on snapshot them so you can start your experiment uh, from the modified image. And we very importantly provide Jupyter integration, which is something that most of our users uh, right now require. Right? And again, all of this is available via web GUI, via command line interface, and via Jupyter, Jupyter and Python. Right? You can also use Jupyter and Bash, but, uh, but most of our users prefer Python. Right? So we have very consistent set of features between this and what we have um, in, our, in our cloud offering. And, and here's just sort of side-by-side -side comparison for those of you um, who are familiar with Chameleon. Um, the main uh, differences being that we go from bare metal reconfigurability to container-based reconfigurability, right? A lot of edge devices don't support IPMI, and so that would have been difficult to uh, implement. And we go from all resources being owned and operated by Chameleon to mixed ownership model, right? So some well, we have some IoT devices that we provide for our users, but it's also possible for our users to add their own devices. Um, and then if anybody here is interested, of course, uh, please join us. This is a new offering uh, in Chameleon that we're just exploring right now. Um, and there are various links here, you know, if you want to, to use uh, those Edge devices, if you want to learn about them. We've had a series of, of webinars last month, um, and we've got the recordings online. And of course, please do join our Edge users mailing list. We're trying to learn as much as possible about user experiments this summer, and we're trying to have a workshop at the end of the summer, sort of a community workshop where people can share their experiments and also the insight into what works for them and what doesn't work. So uh, everybody here is invited. Please give it a shot. Uh, tell us what you think. And now to change gears just uh, a little bit. So Chameleon is a testbed uh, and provides resources that our users can share. What we would also like to do is to help our users make their research more shareable, right? So we kind of figured we've got a, a watering hole, so to speak, where everybody comes to do their research because there are interesting resources available. And so long as we have that, that watering stall, we could we could open a lemonade stand, right? And, and allow them to uh, get their refreshment better. Right, so, so the overarching goal here is 
can we make experiments, user experiments, the digital representation of user experiments shareable? And can we make them as shareable as papers are today? Right? When I, when I uh, start a new line of research, I go and, and look at various papers and see what others have done in that area. But I don't right now, I don't today rerun their experiments and play with them and try them on a different hardware and see what happens. I, I don't do that and I would like to, right? And I would like to enable our users to do that as well. So when we, when we look at the possibility of doing that, um, it, it occurs to me that there are a lot of things that you actually already have by having a shared test bed, right? So first of all, you have a baseline, you have the same hardware for everybody. So it's no longer the case that I can do research on, on a GPU cluster because my department has it and you can't because your department doesn't have it, right? Everybody has access to the same resources, including the, the same specific node, right? You can allocate that. Secondly, there's an interesting thing that happens when you use clouds, right? You have to deploy an image on a remote machine. That means that this image um, is now configured, can be saved, can be snapshotted, and can be given to somebody else who can now also deploy it on that machine, right? Now, this doesn't happen if you're doing your research on your laptop, because your laptop, um, you know, maybe you know how you configure your laptop, right? Maybe you don't, because maybe it's not your laptop, but it's some machine in a lab that, that a system administrator configured. So you may or may not have knowledge and control over the experimental environment that you're running in, right? Sometimes you think you have that knowledge, but you don't necessarily, right? So you don't, you don't have to uh, control that environment, and so you don't. With clouds, you do, right? So that already creates a lot of um, artifacts that could be reproduced uh, or they could be used for reproducibility that could be used to help others repeat your experimental environment. So what is missing on top of that, right? We have the, the shared resources. We have the environment on those resources. What else do we need to do? Well, um, we need to run the experiment, right? So we somehow need to list the actions that we do for running the experiment. And we have to put it all together, right? We have to document it that it was this hardware with this uh, experimental container, and then I ran this in it, and maybe also explain why. So, it, uh, you know, so, so first uh, a quick rundown of what we already do in Chameleon. So in Chameleon, we have a fine-grained description of the hardware, as I described uh, at the beginning. We version it, so every time we, we change that hardware a little bit, you will know about this because the version will have changed. Our users produced thousands and thousands of images and orchestration templates that represent their experimental environment, right? And they produce this as a side effect of doing the test, but they haven't done anything special, right? They just used cloud the way a cloud was supposed to be used, right? So that can be shared, that can be um, uh, used in experiments. And so on top of that, we also provide integration with Jupyter that helps people package the whole story of their experiment. And we also provide um, shareability via Trovi and Zenodo, which I will talk about now, right? So um, going to uh, packaging the shared experiments, um, relying on the concept of literate programming, um, which was invented by Donald Knuth, of course. And the most uh, popular implementation today of literate programming is Jupyter, right? Which, which um, provides experimental storytelling in that it allows you to express ideas as text, it allows you to express the process, your experimental process as code, and then it allows you to present results as, as graphs or images or however your results come. But from our perspective, Jupyter has one huge drawback, which is the code in those code cells, it gets executed in a, in a Docker container on the back end of, of uh, Jupyter or Jupyter installation. Now, our users, they don't want to use Docker containers, right? They generally want to use something like this. Well, what you see here is multiple nodes and multiple switches <coughs> and multiple network connections between uh, in, in a distributed experiment. So what we did is we extended Jupyter by the Chameleon testbed, right? So we integrated Jupyter with the Chameleon testbed so that when you log into the test that your credentials become implicit in your code cells, and then you can go out 
into the test bed and create our experimental containers and run with them. Um, and now we're working actually on, on something that will allow you to bind your code cells to specific servers uh, in your experiment, right? So if you're a distributed experiment, especially something with edge devices, uh, you can program each of them individually from one Jupyter notebook. And if you're interested, they, there, there's a little paper about this. But now you have the packaging of your experiment and the question arises, how do you share it, right? If you want to send it to your colleague and say, hey, you know, I've, I've got it, uh, I've got my experiment here, will you reproduce it? It would be good if that could be done with one click, if that could be done easily. And so we created something uh, called Trovi that functions a little bit like a Google Drive for experiments, right? And you, you, you're writing a proposal with somebody and you create a Google Drive for that and you put, you know, proposal text and letters of support and images and all goes into that Google Drive, right? When you're doing an experiment, something very similar happens, right? You're going to have data, you're going, you're going to have images, you're going to have Jupyter notebooks and, and so forth. Um, so Trovi gives you those buckets into which you can throw your experiments with one click, share it with just a few people or, or share it with, with many people. Um, and then um, after that, after you shared that with Trovi, you can actually publish it by a publishing platform called Zenodo, which will um, assign a digital object identifier to your experiment. So now you can reference your experiment from your paper, right? You could even embed the link in your paper so that people can click through and redo that same experiment on Chameleon. And right now we're working with the uh, reproducibility initiative at Supercomputing to allow papers accepted to Supercomputing 21 to do something very much like that. Um, you know, in a, in a broader sense, this raises the question of what um, sharing experiments will do to our publishing ecosystem, right? So if we think about uh, our traditional publishing ecosystem, we write papers, we put them in proceedings, put the proceedings in libraries, and then um, uh, people or, or other scientists have a way of finding them via some sort of indexing system. Now, sharing digital research is a little bit different than sharing papers, right? Because when I share a paper, I, I don't really need any special tools in order to read a paper. Maybe I need a pair of glasses, right? But that's it. Um, experiments come in digital form, in the form of zeros and ones, right? So to read an experiment, you need a little bit of help. This is why a testbed might be an essential element of a publishing ecosystem for digital artifacts, right? And if you think about it, this is this is very similar to what we do today uh, with some artifacts in the libraries, right? If the library has a microfilm, um, they're going to let me share that uh, microfilm by providing a, a microfilm reader, right? In in a test bed, you're going to have a reader, a player for your experiment. Okay. And some, a few parting thoughts. Um, like I said, uh, Chameleon is a shareable research instrument, but it's also a sharing platform, right? So we're trying to help our users share their research just as we are creating a platform where they can share various different resources. Now, scientific instruments, building scientific instruments is, is difficult because they have to change with the science itself, right? And the example that I gave of that uh, in, in the talk today is we had a cloud test bed, but we didn't have an edge test bed. Now, with the proliferation of edge devices, with the fact that, that a lot of data nowadays is produced at edge, it became increasingly important for our users to have access to that kind of platform. And so we provided this capability for them. And that's all I have for today. Thank you for listening. I don't know if there's uh, time for questions, but but if there is, um, I'm, I'm, I would be happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, there was there was a question from the from the audience uh, uh, regarding uh, heterogeneity of these uh, environments and the support of the uh, chameleon. Uh, so how how does it support? I mean, 
do you see any any disadvantages here yeah, to 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 use a heterogeneous environment in terms of uh, variety of uh, architectures and uh, biometers? Well, from from our perspective, um, you know, the more heterogeneous, the better, right? Because we provide an experimental test bed, and uh, in a sense, one metric of our success is how many experiments, how many different experiments we can support, right? Of course, it's more expensive to support um, a heterogeneous environment, right? Because you have to support all the different ways in which users might want to access different resources. You have to support different platforms. But in a sense, that's also, that's the business we're in, so to speak, right? That's, um, that's what a testbed uh, is supposed to do. Thank you. And uh, one one more question, academia and industry. So uh, nowadays uh, in Europe, uh, there is uh, there is a focus to to use uh, the same environment for uh, industrial purposes, uh, for for R and D in general. Yeah, but by the academia and uh, industry, uh, does it support also this uh, this approach? I mean, in terms of bidding, in terms of uh, security. Uh, and uh, access to uh, the same data. Yeah, so I think that this is a case where um, it, it depends, you know, it, it depends on what exactly you're doing, whether it makes sense uh, for industry and academia to uh, support the same environments, right? I can see uh, from, from working with my colleagues in industry that sometimes uh, they represent different patterns and there may be a need for uh, different capabilities. From our perspective, uh, as an experimental test bed, um, I have not seen significant difference between what's required by industry and what's required uh, by academia, right? Every, everybody wants to, as broad a platform as possible, to, to run as broad a set of experiments. And to some extent, this is also why we're using OpenStack as a base in Chameleon. Uh, OpenStack is used um, very, in, uh, you know, very common in academia, but also very, very common in industry for uh, configuring private clouds, right? So there is the advantage of familiarity of various different researchers. Um, you know, there, there are the other advantages of, of leveraging contributions and the ability to contribute, um, but also a huge advantage, which we just uh, actually recently realized, is the fact that there are mainstream tools that connect to mainstream platforms. Uh, so for example, if you want to move between Chameleon and commercial clouds right now, uh, this is very easy because there are tools that convert images, that convert orchestration templates, right? Um, uh, OpenStack itself supports cloud formation, which is, of course, the uh, the Amazon orchestration format, right? So, so that then all of a sudden opens the door to, to more sharing and to easier development, right? But that's not to say, I mean, I, I um, you know, flog my use case, right? Because um, we're, we're, of course, interested in, in providing as broad a platform as possible, uh, but I can see that there could be use cases, um, especially connected to data privacy, um, where, where different tools might be needed in academia and, and uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I see there are several other questions, but I am doubt we, we don't have uh, time right now, so let, let's, let's keep it uh, offline. Thank you very much once again. Absolutely. And, and I just wanted to say, if anybody's questions, please uh, email me. I will be delighted to answer uh, all the questions and, and uh, help with anything I can. Thank you so much.